everyone, and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host, Yvonne Heath, author of the book, Love Your Life to Death, and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So I am absolutely delighted. I had I kind of tricked my new friend, Ken, into coming back for a second show. Um, I'm here with Ken Ross for the second time. He is um, just an incredible human who is um, the president and founder of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation and just happens to be the son of the late Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who was the pioneer of talks, uh, talking with patients who were dying, and she wrote a book on death and dying, changed the world, influenced my nursing career and the career of millions of people. And um, I'm just we had our conversation. I said, I'm sorry, we have more to talk about. So <laughs> I'm going to stop talking so that you can talk. Hello, Ken. How are you doing today? I am good. Enjoying life as usual. Yeah. Uh, perplexed by it, but embracing it too. <laughs> well, and that's, yes, it's kind of like that, isn't it? And I did comment uh, before we were on camera, but I have to say, um, you have created this incredible beautiful space uh to have these uh, these conversations and i want everybody to know that when they see the back that is your photography isn't it yes i've uh, been privileged and spoiled to uh travel to 101 countries so far in my life and you know my mom taught me to see the world before i leave it so here i am see the world before you leave it i love that so much and and you you have a website and your photography is just it, it's just captivating and so i just it's just so striking i'm really really pleased to see them up on your wall and not in a closet as you exactly said they were. where they were for so long so. yes yes so um when we had our conversation um earlier uh, we were talking about your life and uh, traveling with your mother the I mean, her, her life, the incredible life of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a doctor and uh, started having conversations with dying patients. And she, she truly changed the trajectory of, of how, we, how we see end of life. And, um, and then, I mean, she just did so much more than, oh, there goes one of your cats. She just did so much more than any of us no, or many of us know. And so I needed to bring you back to say her work was not just on death and dying. Her work was not just having these conversations. She was so much more. And the world needs to know this. And that's part yeah. of your mission, isn't it? Exactly. You know, people are pigeonholing my mother, you know, between either on death and dying or the five stages, you know, oh, mom, you're Ken, your mom did that one great book. I'm like, well, you know, she did a lot more than that, but yes, <laughs> I know her for something, but you know, yeah, be nice if you thought of her as, you know, the hospice pioneer, the palliative care pioneer, you know, absolutely who changed bioethics in Western culture in medicine. And, and I will tell you right now, I am one of those people. I was a nurse and nursing, a nursing student. I read the book uh, on death and dying. And yes, I Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, here is her, her one great book. My mother, who is a nurse, had read it many years before in her studies. And I was just absolutely oblivious to all that she brought. And we must talk about, you know, the elephant in the room. There it is. The five <laughs> stages of grief that the right. whole, they, I said the whole world just took those and ran with them. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm just, I stole some, uh, I watched our talk again and some of the things that her message was that grief was made up of different components, which was radical thinking. Right. She wanted to start the conversation, not end it. Exactly. And she wasn't saying there's five stages of grief for everything you go through and that's it. She was saying it was complex. We have to talk yeah. about this. Yeah. So, you know, she said, let's have a conversation. This is a good place to start. So, you know, people just get so hung up. They want to like, you know, catch you. Ah, there's really six stages or seven or 12. I've seen up to like 23 stages, Wow. you know, and by 1974, my mom was completely tired of hearing about the stages. Mm -hmm. I mean, she rarely talked about it. If you went to a lecture, she wasn't talking about the stages. She's talking about a hundred other things. And yet that's what society is fixated on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's often misrepresented. And people are like, oh, she was wrong. It wasn't linear, even though she said it wasn't linear. No. People get hung up on the kind of social media 
popular media, you know, I saw it on 30 Rock and that's not the way it is. I'm like, well, <laughs> right, that's not the way it is. That's not why she, she didn't write it for 30 Rock. So no. she, didn't, she didn't write it for Castle or for, you know, whatever these movies are. You mm -hmm. know, it's been in a hundred plus TV shows. <gasps> wow. Wow. And in over 50 movies, it's, you know, over a hundred musicians have written songs named after my mother or the stages. My You know, goodness. so obviously it's resonated with people, mm -hmm. but, you know, kind of the higher you go, the more you get shot down. So. <clears throat> wow. That is incredible. I was, yeah, I was watching Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. Well, I was watching Grey's Anatomy the other night and it was on. I'm like, oh, I have to tell Ken this. Like, <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, no, no, it's not. Right. And, yeah. And in Grey's Anatomy, they say there are five stages. There are five stages. Like, well, like we it's want, the gospel. <laughs> we want people want a framework they want a timeline for grief and right. that is just not yeah, what yeah. she that is not accurate that is not the way grief works that is right. not what her work was it was so much more she was starting the conversation and helping people exactly. understand that it was complex right so you know uh you know and the problem is people see that on tv and they go oh you know elizabeth like oh she was crazy like she just wants us to believe her five stages i'm like she didn't even talk about it from like 74 up until right before her death when she agreed to do another book about it because she's so frustrated at the way people had misconstrued it i but, uh, i just yeah, love being in the know <laughs> yeah it's meant to be a loose guideline to one concept of dealing with grief uh, yes. And yes, it was written about dying patients initially, but even if you look in On Death and Dying from 69, she begins to have the idea that it applies to the families and the staff as well. And in her second book in 1972, she said that. So when people say Elizabeth never meant it to, I'm like, well, you know, if you look at her book, she clearly says, oh, this applies to blind people. This applies to the families, you know. This is a model to deal with loss and change, mm -hmm. whether it's grief, whether you're getting a divorce, you flunked your midterm, whatever it is, she identified this defense mechanism is what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's not just for grief. And she was just realizing that as on death and dying came out. So it's not fully kind of written about in that book. So people say, aha, she didn't do it about, you know, grief i'm like well yeah six months later she did and it's clearly written in the second book so you know people just like to kind of catch up but you know yeah the point is like have the conversation you know if you like other models that's great if you don't believe in models that's great if if you you know but the stages have helped millions of people i mean you look online and there's really? tens of thousands of articles saying yes i went through the stages and there's also many articles saying I didn't go through it. And that's yes. exactly right. It's not for everyone. It doesn't describe every situation. Right. But yes, it does describe a, you know, a block of people do have that experience. And Absolutely. for someone to say, well, I didn't have it, so it doesn't exist. I find very narcissistic, like, okay, kind you see, yeah. grief is complicated. So therefore it can exist. That doesn't make sense. If grief is complicated, then it can exist as one idea one way that people do grief but not everyone yeah. so and I, those same people yeah. are saying well if it doesn't apply to everyone then it's no good i'm like no <laughs> you know well no and and i just again when like i say she she wanted to help people understand that it was complex and these were some of her observations she was she wasn't doing a big research and and you know creating all kinds of, she was just saying these are conversations i've had and this is what i've observed in these conversations right. Let's bring uh, death out of the closet and let's start talking about it. Let's start talking about it. And, and so, I mean, when I wrote my book, that was one of the first things I wanted to do is have, you know, part of her like talk about those stages, not because I was saying this is exactly how it goes. It was important work. And and that's what we need to. It was the beginning of, of opening these conversations. And there are a lot of people. It helps you understand, especially the anger. Mm -hmm. Anger is, uh, grief is often disguised as anger and people do not, right? They don't recognize it. They find right. it very challenging. And she mm -hmm. wrote about that. This is the hardest for staff and for families to cope mm -hmm. with. And right. that's and, important to know. Yeah. And then she developed a method to deal with it through her workshops. You know, it's not just like, okay, well, anger is like, you know, you know, 
we know what it is, and I'm providing you a model to deal with it through her life, death, and transition workshops, which were given all over the world. And those were life changing, you know. And at the same time, she's doing AIDS projects, vet projects. She helped start the first hospice in a jail in California in the 80s. People never give her recognition for that. She was seeing patients, you know, she had a, a working farm. She was, you know, a mother. I mean, oh. you know. And she did this all basically from her 40s to her 60s and retired. I mean, that's just, it's so incredible. And I, I'm honored to to bring a voice to this, you know, bigger picture than so many of us recognize. And so uh, of the 24 plus books mm -hmm. that she's written, I will encourage everybody go learn more about Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross because there's just so much. And I love that you've taken the reins of the foundation. People can learn so much about her work if they go to the website, right? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we have websites in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Flemish, French, and Japanese, I believe, right now. Oh, my goodness. And we're working on some other projects because we're really about, you know, going after cultural diversity and providing vehicles for people to deal with grief in other cultures, not just in America, but in other cultures as well, of course. Well, that is so extraordinary. And I know you're very passionate about real in realizing that people die horribly all mm. over the world right yeah. and so your goal is to grow this in continue to grow this internationally and and change that in countries all over the world i mean how yeah, we're amazing very excited that you know it's taken a long time but i think we've we're getting a lot of traction now and uh i can't remember if i mentioned it last time we we're starting the very first freestanding hospice in rio oh it's like, how can Rio not have a hospice? I mean, one of the yeah. biggest cities in the world. Right. You know, it's just shocking at the lack of care and people just don't realize, they assume everyone has these services and they don't. It's yes. And so once again, you're being a voice by saying, listen, <laughs> these wonderful and, and hospices and palliative care has been a tremendous movement and in North America and in different countries, and it isn't everywhere. Right. right. It is not everywhere. And so we have to start somewhere. And I have I, I, I just want to say to you once again, thank you for taking the reins and, and being a voice, because I'm sure it's not always easy. <laughs> no, it's not. But, you know, I mean, you're one of those voices out there, too. It's it's challenging because people don't like to talk about the D word. Right. Death. Oh, the <laughs> D word. Yes, exactly. So. Exactly. Well, I know I had someone when I wrote my book, Love Your Life to Death, she said, why did you put the word death in there? That's not very, people don't want to read that. And I said, well, that's why I wrote the book. Because exactly. people yeah. are, the whole you know, point. <laughs> that's the whole point. They're scared to death of death. And your mom's for, on death and dying. This is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, it's just such, it's just such rewarding, extraordinary work and when people instead of allowing their fears to stop them and to embrace them have these conversations diffuse the fear because i'm sorry everybody dies <laughs> we exactly. all are going to face our death or the death of a loved one and you know most likely more than one person that you care about will die do we not want to be a part of that can we do it you know we can do death better and that starts with ha with having these conversations, right? And being able to just show up at that bedside in the dying process. Mm -hmm. I mean, like your mother, her dying, her, her her illness or chronic illness or, you know, after her stroke was nine years. That is a long journey. Yes, it is. So she has more lessons to learn. Yeah, apparently she had a lot. And, and you did. And, and I know, I have no doubt in those nine years, she she taught many people many things, oh, right? Yeah. She taught them compassion and patience and and all of the other things. Um, well, she had three books come out in the last nine years. I mean, this is when she was like retired and paralyzed. <laughs> so, oh my god! I mean, yeah. I'm just absolutely in awe of everything. And and I do. Um, one of my goals is to read every single one of her books and to truly <laughs> broaden. That's going to take me a while. And broaden my understanding, and and I know I will be in awe of it all. Um, and the other the other thing that I I wanted to chat about today, which is so awesome, um, I saw you on um, was it Mission Hospice mm -hmm. that you shared a tremendous talk, mm -hmm. right? On yes, yeah, and yeah, our good friends over there at Mission. <laughs> yes, phenomenal organization. And you were talking about 
the pioneers of hospice and palliative care. And again, I'm the first to admit, I wasn't really sure how your mom fit in. And then we have Dame Cicely Saunders and, right. and, and right. Alpha how Brown. did they? Yes. So, so the four, right? right. Dame Cicely Saunders, Florence Wald, your mom, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Bel Dr. Belfour Mount, which mm -hmm. a Canadian. He's still, he's still alive. <laughs> who's still living yes and everyone and and the rest it's interesting because the other the three ladies died in 2004 5 and 8 so they mm -hmm. all within the same time frame but these 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 four pillars these pioneers were like the pioneers of the hospice movement and education and i, I would love for you to just speak a little about the four and how their work was so important and, and integral to hospice and palliative care yeah, uh, and also I have to mention Balfour's book just came out, which is really, he's been working on it for, I think, over a decade, because I saw him, I went had dinner at his house probably 12 years ago, and he was talking about working on the book, so that was 12 years ago. Wow, okay. It literally came out last week. So, oh, so Dr. Balfour Mount, go get his book. Okay. Mount, palliative Care, he's the father of Palliative Care. Yes. Um, he uh, came up with the word because he was working in Canada, Mm. And he said, I think hospice has a different meaning in French. So he decided, he looked up Latin roots and things and decided palliative care was a good word to use okay. for seriously ill people. Mm -hmm. Not dying people. Right. Another thing. <laughs> seriously ill people. So yes. <clears throat> don't be scared of getting palliative care. It doesn't mean they're pushing you out the door here. <laughs> so. It's for anyone with a life limiting disease to increase the quality of their life. Of exactly. Their and it includes living. pain control. Very important. You want yes. pain control. That's yes, that is want, a big distinction. Yeah. You want people who understand what you're going through, and there's different ways of approaching it that you don't necessarily get with standardized care in a, in a hospital. So Absolutely. you want palliative care. You want palliative <laughs> That's <your> care. Friend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, what's interesting um, is the similarities between Dame Cicely Saunders, who started the very first modern hospice yes. um, in London in 67, and uh, my mom, Elizabeth, because both of them were heavily influenced by Polish immigrants. Uh, Dame Cicely Saunders had a Polish immigrant who was dying, fell mm -hmm. in love with him, and upon his death, uh, he left her some money, which he used to go into medical school, because she realized, unless you got those little letters after your name, She's yeah. not going to be able to do what she wanted to do. Yeah. Um, that and the death of her father, which was in 1961, which is the same year my mother's dad died. And his death had a huge effect on my mother because he lay dying at a hospital and he didn't want to die there. So my mom took me over to Europe when I was, I think, under one years old. Um, and with her sisters came back at night and stole her father out of the window without permission. Oh, oh, so, another juicy story about your mom. <laughs> yeah, so, so he got to spend the last few days of his life at home with his three daughters all singing by the piano, drinking his favorite wine. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1961, right? So this like gave her the idea like, wow, we need to have people die at home because this is the way to do it. And that was part of her motivation when she helped begin the hospice movement. <clears throat> Wow. So very important and very, you know, ironic that both Sicily and Elizabeth had these like strong influences of Polish refugees and their fathers dying. Mm. So and and both of them became doctors, which is very important because without being doctors, I don't think they'd be able to do what they did. Right. Right. Uh, and Sicily's idea was the concept of total pain. You know, we just patients are in total pain and we need to approach the patient from a multifaceted view. Mm -hmm. And my mother had the same concept, although she took it from Jung. So her idea, um, which was equivalent, I think, of Cicely's total pain concept, was the four quadrants. Right. So my mom talked about the emotional care, the intellectual, physical, and spiritual. She said, you're not treating a patient unless you're treating all four quadrants. You cannot truly heal somebody, or even if you're not sick, uh, any person has to deal with themselves balancing the four quadrants of life. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's so brilliant. And and so here they were. You're, so your mom lived, you were in the States at that time, and, and Dame Cicely Saunders was in the UK, right? Right. 
And, um, and it was also interesting that they were both born like maybe what, 260 miles apart, these two hospice <laughs> pioneers, you know, so that's pretty surprising. Yes. Um, and they're both incredibly headstrong. They both were incredibly talented at listening. Listening was like the key to both of them, sitting down and listening to the patient's needs, not projecting their own business, their own needs. This is the hospital's rules, you know, like demedicalizing mm. the patient and the experience oh. of dying. You know, that was the whole thing where everything was becoming more technology, more, more, more. They were all about less. Focus on the person as a person. Sit in the bed and hold their hand. It's more important than taking their temperature or their blood pressure. Yeah, when they're dying. Blood count is better. Aren't we happy? Ah, like, you know, yes. whatever. Oh, my goodness. So they they met, right? They, yeah, they met. Um, they're both a little headstrong, so I wouldn't say they're like the best of friends, but <laughs> they were collaborative associates. Yeah. Absolutely. And then so and Florence Wald was an American nurse nurse and they said that she was the mother of Amer the American hospice movement. Did yeah. Yeah, well I'd say again Florence and Elizabeth were kind of hand in hand because right. you have to change society in order to right. allow hospices to flourish. And without sure. that, you know, you can build it, but it will not come. Absolutely. So, so Florence, you know, was friends with Cicely. She went over there got some training. Cicely came over and helped uh, Florence in Connecticut there. And so they together built a project after a couple of years. And so I think uh, Florence's hospice began in 72, no, 74. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and, you know, again, my mother began laying the groundwork in 69 with going right. out and speaking to thousands of people every week. Right. And laying the groundwork for yes. society to change their concept and allow this this beautiful and creation of hospice to flourish. Well, you have to diffuse some of the fear, right? Yeah. Actually, I mean, imagine just building a hospice and saying, hey, you can come here and die. People would just No, no, no. I don't want to go to die. I yeah. want to go to the hospital where they're going to get me to live. Gonna, <laughs> right. And, and so, yeah, so your mom with her message and her speaking was laying the groundwork and they were building the hospices over here. And it, I mean, it's just, it's so incredibly interesting how yeah. you were all the, the pioneers. You, you Right. But, but they all worked, they all worked together to some extent and they yeah. all respected each other. They, they had conferences together, I believe in Quebec to kind of, you know, develop this idea of palliative care and hospice. Um, and, um, what, what did Florence used to say? There was doers, doers and shakers. I can't remember. She had a phrase for it, Yeah. but she said like, you know, Florence was working in Connecticut. Balfour was working in Canada. Cicely was in London and Elizabeth was like every place on the planet. <laughs> you know, she was like the town crier, Johnny Appleseed yeah. going out with a message so that these these people could flourish and promote their ideas. So it was a beautiful symbiotic relationship between these four individuals. I just, it, it, I think that's just so extraordinary. And again, social change takes many voices. And right. as I mentioned the last time we spoke, I'm really sad that, you know, I wrote my book in 2015 and I, we're still working on these same things. Your, your mom and these incredible pioneers laid the groundwork. And I mean, hospice and palliative care, beautiful movements. And we still have a long way to go. We yeah, still have a yeah. long way to go. Even in the United States. <laughs> and Canada. And Canada. And, Canada, right? and the West. <laughs> right? But, but here's the thing. You know, the more we are having these conversations, the more people are engaging and saying, okay, I need to learn. Read these books. These pioneers have, uh, read their stories, have conversations, visit mm -hmm. a hospice, figure out what palliative care is. Right. I had a patient say, the palliative care team is going to speak to you. She said, am I dying? I said, no, we want you to have great quality of life. You are living, mm -hmm. right? And, and so the more we have these conversations, the better. And of course, they can learn what, tell me the website again, Ken, because I want people to go to the website and learn more about your incredible work. Thank you. It's ekrfoundation.org. Um, and then we also have a list of our international chapters on that website. So I think we probably have like a dozen websites around the world in, in different languages. Um, and we just opened up our group in Argentina and Uruguay this last weekend. 
and now we're working on a group in Colombia and we're beginning discussions with some people in Spain, Portugal, Bolivia, and Lebanon. Oh my gosh, I absolutely love it. So, and I knew this would fly by, we only have a few minutes. Can you just, is there one just brief, wonderful glimpse or story you can share that um, in the, your travels with your mom that just really touched your heart? And, uh, is, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's hundreds of stories because you're doing this to honor your mother's work, but is there something mm -hmm. you'd like to share? A great story. Well, I was, always found it amazing because here was like a Swiss woman working in America, talking about death, like something people didn't talk about. And but something, you know, and other people have done, you know, incredible books on death and dying. I, I don't know, like, for example, are you familiar with this book? I am not. So this is amazing. Like, you know, nobody knows about this book. This was like the death and dying of 1965. Oh, okay. these two doctors were talking about how Death is a terrible thing in America, but, you know, so I'm it's not saying Elizabeth was the only person to talk about this in the 60s, but somehow her way of messaging struck a chord, you know, right. and so now we have over 10 million sales in 41 languages, and we're still selling books in new languages we never sold before. We just sold Mongolian, just so it's selling in Arabic and Hebrew, so yeah. the fact that it's in both languages, a psychology book, you know, that's amazing. So, it anyway, is amazing. you know, I just say focus on your unfinished business, challenge your fears, live your life love based, and just, you know, go out there and take a chance because we're all terminal. So what are you going to lose? I mean, you know. And that is a beautiful message. And Ken, I cannot thank you enough. I know we're going to stay in touch and I want to learn so much more about your work. Thank you for, for shedding some light and continuing to be the change that your mother started. And likewise, thank well, you. not that your mother started, but that you were starting. Thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Thank so, you very much. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Real life. Always a pleasure. Yes, learning about how to just show up for yourself and others and sometimes have hard conversations. So my call to action, as always, plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, bring your own tambourine to the party. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.